It's a really good story, and I like good stories. I like good characters. And this was one whale of an epic. I was thinking today, seeing it, it's not far off a sort of movie opera. I killed two people. There was something about it I didn't like. I enjoyed it. The Arab bureaus seem to think you would be of some use to them in Arabia. Why, I can't imagine. I have the same problem, sir. No Arab loves the desert. There is nothing in the desert. No man needs nothing. The Nefut cannot be crossed. I'll cross it if you will. You are mad. This Arab army, what's it consist of? Irregular cavalry, sir. About 2,000. Where are they now? Damascus, Orange, not this. Orange! Whatever I ask them to do can be done, that's all. They know that if you don't. Pound them! Do you think I'm just anybody? Do you? Lord Allenby, could you give me a few words about Colonel Lawrence? What, more words? The revolt in the desert played a decisive part in the Middle Eastern campaign. Uh, yes, sir, but about Colonel Lawrence himself? No, no, I didn't know him well, you know. The real Lawrence of Arabia is somebody really enshrined in sort of myth in Britain. But in the 30s and 40s, he was massive figure, even though you know, a lot of that time he was dead. He died young and created a lot of myth about himself by doing that. And he couldn't just die in a motorcycle accident. There had to be conspiracy theories. When you're that sort of a celebrity, by dying young, you create a huge myth around yourself. There's a great phrase of a biography somebody once wrote about him, backing into the limelight. He craved privacy, anonymity, and yet loved to be famous. The key thing about Lawrence of Arabia is when this American guy, Lowell Thomas, put on his lecture show about him. That made Lawrence very famous. And this was also the time when the movie industry was really getting up and running. And so a film about Lawrence of Arabia became very desirable. A lot of producers wanted to do it. And for various reasons, no film was made until David Lean's film. But there were loads of attempts beforehand. Lawrence of Arabia was discussed by David Lean and I long before the film was made and before we'd even met Sam Spiegel or even knew of his existence. We used to meet every day and discuss projects, generally in films and so on, before we were actually engaged actively on one production. We discussed the making of Lawrence Arabia with Alexander Corder, with whom we were working at the moment, who was the head of London Films, and he had certain reservations about the making a film of Lawrence Arabia. They were partly political. There were all sorts of things, but it was abortive at that time. And the reason why Lawrence Arabia was finally made was because when Bridge on the River Kwai was finished and was such a success, Spiegel said to David, what other ideas have you ever had? Naturally, they talked about other ideas, and David mentioned Lawrence Arabia, and that was how Lawrence Arabia finally came about. Uh, Mr. Bentley, you must know as much about Colonel Lawrence as anybody does. Yes, it was my privilege to know him and to make him known to the world. He was a poet, a scholar, and a mighty warrior. Thank you. He was also the most shameless exhibitionist since Barnum and Bailey. When it was decided we'd make Lawrence, we first of all had to meet with his brother, Professor Arnold. Lawrence, because Lawrence, of course, was dead, and all his affairs and his copyrights were in the hands of his brother, 
and we all thought that the worst thing that he would think was that Hollywood are somehow horning in on Seven Pillars of Wisdom and want to make a Hollywood film. There were a lot of meetings with Lawrence who didn't want to sell the copyright at all, but finally was persuaded to do so by David Lean and with Spiegel helping, provided he had ultimate and total script approval of the script when it was written. They brought in Michael Wilson as the first screenwriter. Michael Wilson, again, was a sort of natural choice for them because he'd worked on Quiet without credit because he was blacklisted. Wilson was to have huge problems. He worked on the project for over two years. It ran to nearly 400 pages and Lean did not like it and they had to get another writer. Robert Bolt was a playwright who'd had huge success in the West End with A Man for All Seasons. He'd read Seven Pillars of Wisdom, was flown out to Ackenborough, put on Spiegel's yacht and wrote the script from there. Lawrence, sir. Take him in. Good morning, sir. Salute. If you're insubordinate of me, Lawrence, I shall put you under arrest. It's my manner, sir. Go on. My manner, sir. It looks insubordinate, but it isn't really. Well, I can't make out whether you're bloody bad-mannered or just half-witted. I have the same problem, sir. Shut up. Yes, sir. The casting of this was difficult from the word go, really. They wanted Marlon Brando, and they had a press conference even to announce that Marlon Brando would be in it. But Brando ducked out of it. So then they went for a sort of relative unknown route, which is probably a better route to go on. And they got Albert Finney, who was a great London stage actor at the time, and I think had just briefly been in a movie, maybe. And he did a long screen test with Lean in a studio with actors, costumes, sets, the whole thing. It was like a mini movie, really. They all thought it was a very impressive job he did and was offered the part and he turned them down. So after that, they went for Peter O'Toole, who was another fine stage actor. The opportunity of, of what turned out to be a great adventure. Playing T. Lawrence was the bigger challenge. Placed in the circumstance of working in the desert, on top of a camel at 127 in the shade, covered in fleas, is not exactly helpful. To be great again, it seems that we need the English or... Oh. What no man can provide, Mr. Lawrence. We need a miracle. The supporting roles sort of fell into place with Sam Spiegel doing his great producer's number and Lean asking for Alec Guinness. Stand and fight! Stand and fight! And yeah! Anthony Quinn was brought in as the requisite big American star, which every film had to have. It was really strange meeting David because there was a machine-like quality about him, and almost as if one of his eyes was a camera, as a matter of fact. No doubt, because he looked at you as with a camera. I was supposed to meet him in Jordan. He was already shooting the picture with Peter O'Toole there. And I had Charlie Parker, who's a great friend of mine, put on a nose for me and give me a beard. It was hot. My goodness, it was a hot day, about 150 or 60. One of the hottest days I've ever experienced in my life. Then I had to go around the hill to meet David. I wanted to meet him as casually as possible with the makeup and so he'd have an idea what he was going to be seeing on the screen. So as I walked out of the cabin where they were making me up, the men under the cliffs looked at me and one of them said, How da? How da butai? And pretty soon everybody was caught by it. Everybody started calling out the name, How da? How da butai? How da? How da? So as we walked down, David Lane was directing Peter O'Toole, and I realized that I was disturbing the scene. So David Lane says, cut. And he says, what the hell is that? And he sent our first assistant up, and he said, find out who that is. And the assistant came back, and he said, they're calling that man at the head of him, how da butai? And he said, well, I'll be damned. Yes, yes. I, he is out of Abu Tai. Yes, can't we fire this man Quinn that we hired for the picture? <laughs> I almost got fired. What do you mean by coming here dressed like that? Amateur theatricals? Oh, yes, entirely. 
Let me see that uh, hat thing or whatever it is. The fascinating gear they wear. How do you think I would look in this hat? It's damn ridiculous, sir. Yeah, you keep it. Jack Hawkins had worked with Lean before on Bridge on the Require. Perfect casting for Allenby. Really? What do you think, Dryden? Before he did it, sir, I'd have said it couldn't be done. Claude Rains had worked with Lean before in the film called Passionate Friends. Then there was the American journalist, who's another interesting thing, Jackson Bentley. He too was a sort of loosely based on Lowell Thomas, who was really out there in the First World War covering these events. And they hired Edmund O'Brien. He shot for two or three weeks and then had a heart attack on the way back for a break in America and had to drop out. And they got Arthur Kennedy. Jimmy, never seen a man killed with a sword before. Why don't you take a picture? Wish I had. In Cairo, you will put off these funny clothes. You will wear trousers and tell stories of our quaintness and barbarity. And then they will believe you. You're an ignorant man. Omar Sharif was fascinating because they did not ever conceive of actually thinking, is there an Arab who could play this Arab? The first one they got was a German, Horst Buchholz, who was going to play it. And then they got Alain Delon, a French actor, big star in France. And then they got another French actor, Maurice Ronet. Maurice Ronet was hired and yanked off to Jordan and sat there for two or three months. And then they started flipping through books of Arab actors and they found Omar Sharif, who could talk English, which was amazing. So he flew out and became a huge star because of it. He is dead. Yes. Why? This is my well. I have drunk from it. You are welcome. One day, somebody said to me, there's a Mr. Spiegel who's in Cairo, and he would like to meet you. I didn't know who Spiegel was, and I didn't know what he wanted to meet me about. And I went, and he said, we're making a film in Jordan called Lawrence of Arabia. And there may be a small part for you, but you have to undergo a screen test. You have to go to Jordan. And I was already an important star in my own little world in the Middle East. And I really could have just said, well, no, I can't be bothered for a small part to go and be tested in Jordan. But when I heard that the director was David Lean, I had been a great admirer of David Lean. I had just seen Bridge on the River Kwai. And I said, I'm not going to miss an opportunity to meet David Lean. And so I said, OK. And I went on a plane, and I landed in the middle of the desert, and I met David Lean. My first image of David Lean was an extraordinary one because I came on this little plane and when I looked out from the plane window, I looked down and there was this huge desert and there was one man standing in it. The plane landed and taxied over to this one man and it stopped and so when you opened the door, he didn't have to move at all. And I came off the plane and he looked at me all over. He had very acute eyes. He looked like a hawk, and he looked at me all around, and he said, how are you, Omar? How very nice of you to come out here. And then he said, oh, come with me, come with me, and he took me to the makeup tent. I had never had a mustache before, and he said, let's try something. Try a little beard, try the beard. He said, that's not too good. He said, try a mustache. And he said, that's not bad, isn't it, Omar? I said, yes, it's very good, David. And then he took me to the wardrobe tent, and he told the wardrobe assistants to go out. He said to them, Omar knows better than you what he should wear. And he sent them out, putting confidence into me, and they, he said, what do you think of a black costume, Omar? And I said, that sounds very good. And he said, remember, Omar, you're a tiger. You're a tiger. <laughs> and that was my first encounter. So I did a screen test. Then they told me, go back to Cairo. We'll contact you if we need to. And about a month later, they sent me a telegram to go to London for discussions. And I went to London, still not knowing what it was all about. And they told me, you got yourself a wonderful part, the part of Ali in Lawrence. I was very excited. And I signed a seven-year contract with Columbia at the same time. Do we rest here? 
There is no rest now short of water or runs. On the other side of that. And how much of that is there? I'm not sure. But however much it must be crossed before tomorrow's sun gets up. This is the sun's anvil. My costume was extremely comfortable. I mean, they were very beautiful robe, and I had 12 of them, the same ones, because I never changed my costume throughout the film. But I had 12 of them because one used to perspire a lot. And when I used to take them off at the end of the day, they were white inside from the salt that my body lost during the day. I think I lost about 20 pounds at least. The Arab clothes were partly bought in the markets in Amman, partly in Syria. I had things made in Syria, all Peter O'Toole's shirts and garments. I'm out of His is the one costume, his abaya, that is a total cheat. I made that up because it looked so good against the desert. All the others, the black and white of Ali and things like that, they're all things that they could have worn, but I didn't actually come across anyone with a black and blue abaya. That was my only bit of self-indulgence, I suppose. Lawrence. Yes? You're supposed to be... Do you usually wear your cap in the mess? Always. The... British Army stuff I got in London, either at the Costumers, Bermans or Nathan's, or some of it I had made. I had Peter O'Toole's uniform made at a tailor in Savile Row called Hawks, because I felt that they'd have had the slightly old-fashioned First World War cut. They also made General Allenby, Jack Hawkins, the costume, and there was an old cutter there who remembered Allenby, so we knew we got him right. But the soldiers, and we must have had about a 1,000 uniforms made at least, we put out for tender in Jordan. There were several factories out there that were used to making the soldiers' clothes out there. But all this had to be going on while one was doing endless sketches and shopping and researching, and one was back and forth quite a bit. Peter's uniform was very deliberately contrived to look ill-fitting, and then we put it through a washing machine and sort of shrank it a bit more and battered it a bit more. It's borrowed. Someone pinched mine. Bloody wogs. It was terribly important because it told you immediately that he was a misfit. And what was amazing when he got to wearing his white robes was how he fitted. And he learned not to stand out like a sore thumb among all those very much shorter Bedouin. He looked as if he belonged. When I arrived in the desert, Peter had already practiced a lot riding camels. And I had never been on a camel. And it's a very difficult thing to learn because you have no stirrups. And the only way to learn how to ride a camel, trotting and galloping, is to sit on it for hours and hours and days and days and weeks and weeks. Because what you have to learn is to get the rhythm and one day you just get it. But for weeks we couldn't sit down properly. David Lean did intensive tests in the desert. He was proud of the fact that he discovered that the desert was not just sand, but it's basalt and rock and all sorts of different surfaces, and not just the sand dunes of romantic Araby and so on. Alouche was our Bedouin guide, and he was an absolute wonderful man. And without speaking any Arabic and without him speaking any English, he used to take me away for two days, three days into the desert to look for places. And he knew exactly what sort of mountain areas to go up to, and there you'd find this beautiful, wonderful spring, fresh water, whatever, that is only known to the Arabs around there. And as far as you can see in every direction, nothing but absolute burning desert. Right at the beginning, I was introduced to Sir Anthony Nutting because he was, in essence, there to bridge the gap for Sam Spiegel and King Hussein because he was a great friend of Hussein and also because he really knew that area of Suez he knows like the back of his hand. He was a very charming, knowledgeable man and a great, great help in the early days on Lawrence. 
King Hussein was very keen for us to be there, and he was extremely helpful. In fact, he gave us the use of Jordanian Air Force Dove and Heron aircraft, which we would fly the principals from Aqaba into the desert, because we had a luxurious sort of campsite right on the beach in Aqaba, which all the crew would fly back to at night. We were called the dedicated maniacs. We stayed in tents out on the mud flats where we were going to be shooting. And that was David in the caravan and about six or eight of the tents for us. We had great solidarity making that thing. I mean, we had this camaraderie that we lived in tents. And we had a little bar which they built in the middle of the desert, very exotic sort of bamboo shoots. And we used to all have drinks together. It can never be made again, you know. You never put a group like that together again. It is for children. I have set myself to learn again. What are you learning from this? Politics. I had not been so long from coming out of school. I went to an English school at that time. And I had a proper accent for an Arab. As a matter of fact, Alec Guinness, when he arrived in the desert, he invited me to have a cup of tea in his tent. And he talked to me for about two hours. He asked me all about my background and all. And the next day when he started shooting, we went to watch him, Peter O'Toole and I. And when he started speaking, Peter said to me, Fred, because he called me Fred, Peter. And he said, he's doing you. I said, is he? Yes. He had taken my accent and used it as the accent of an Arab speaking English. Illusions can be very powerful, particularly when they take this form. Peter O'Toole called me Fred because when I went out to the desert for a screen test, we were introduced, and he had been out there already a month or two learning to ride cameras and all that. And they said to Peter, this is Omar Sharif. And he said, Omar Sharif? He said, no one in the world is called Omar Sharif. Your name must be Fred, which wasn't far wrong. <laughs> I was thinking, you were drifting. I think that Peter had just about the worst possible job, position, star, whatever, on the film, because he was hardly off screen. And it was a very tough job for him. And I think it really took it out of him a great deal, because I think that all the actors used to get very sick of David's intensity, because he was so intense, and it became exceedingly wearing for them. I like talking to actors about the scene, and I look through the camera lens as they are performing on a rehearsal. And because it's got a frame around it, I see exactly, I see it in a more concentrated way, I think. And then go up to them and say, play it a little quieter. Or can you say it as if you are being amused by the other man? That sort of thing. Part of a director's job is tickling a talent particularly with actors. David Lean didn't like actors very much in his personal life. He was wonderful to them while they were shooting. But in the evening, he didn't like actors. He didn't like to eat with actors. He thought they were very vanitous and uninteresting. <laughs> they talked too much about themselves. But he sort of adopted me. I felt somehow that he considered me as a son, in a way. He was very protective of me. So we had a very close relationship. Although he was very aloof, he was not somebody you could get close to. Freddie had this wonderful ability that he was always ready. If the call was 8.30 in the morning, say, at 8.25, he was ready to shoot. Now, we spent many a morning with David inside the caravan saying, tell Freddie I'm not ready yet. And Freddie said, we're all ready to shoot. Why can't, can't we shoot? Well, David's not ready for it yet, Freddie. At that time, the situation was quite spiky because Freddie wanted to get on. David hated coming out and getting started. Once he did, it was all right. Freddie went over to the Panavision offices in Los Angeles and personally picked all the equipment out himself. It was all hand-picked. He chose everything. He chose all the equipment, all the lenses, the whole kit and caboodle. And because it was a Panavision 65mm camera negative, everything was very heavy and very big. There was nothing lightweight about it. Initially, at the beginning, we had problems where there was like little blotches on the film, and nobody could understand what that was. And it was sort of worked out that it was actually because the negative in the camera was getting so hot 
We had always a big sunshade over the camera and a wet cloth on top of the camera, which acted like a bit of a refrigerator thing. Then we had a big catering truck with a refrigeration plant, so the film was kept in a refrigeration truck, so that was no problem about that. You had no modern direct through the lens viewfinders at all like you've got nowadays. They're all offset. What you saw in the viewfinder was not what the camera was seeing. And in particular, that posed a great problem with the shot of Omar Sharif coming out of the Mirage, which was all done in one take with the 450 millimeter lens for that shot. The Mirage, what an entrance for an actor. Hmm. We picked the locations, we did tests, because you can't really photograph a Mirage. Each cut had to be measured. The cuts back onto Lawrence had to be calculated with the cuts the other way onto the mirage, so the mirage suddenly came into reality. Highly professional, but it wasn't emotionally working for me. I said, I've got to do something, David, here. And in fact, on the screen, it's not very obvious, but we painted the white desert out, leaving the middle of the screen white into nothing. So the audience's eye went to the mirage. And I had a last minute idea. We painted white lines going towards the mirage. These lines are about a foot wide, camel tracks, because camel's feet go one in front of the other and leave a track only a foot wide. They don't spread out. We shot the scene. It worked. David actually came up to me. He said, I don't know how long you're going to live, John, but if you live to 100, you'll never do better emotional designing than that. And Peter came up didn't say anything, but he gave me a huge hug. We had two jeeps about maybe a mile away, going round and round and round, churning up the sand. So there was a complete sandstorm as a background to the shot. And it was out of that sandstorm that Sharif rode. And he rode up from infinity. That was, you couldn't even see him through the camera at all at the beginning. And if you dug up the negative, you will see that he comes from that complete long shot and it finishes up on a shot which is just head and shoulders of Omar Sharif on top of his camel. That's all in one take. In fact, I think David wanted to hold it longer, even longer than what is in the picture, but he confessed he lost his nerve. He thought it would be overdoing it. Your uh, friend was a Hazemi of the Beni Salem. I know. I am Ali ibn al-Kharish. I've heard of you. David thought that it was the duty of an actor, and quite rightly so, that you should practice. If you have to use a camera, you should practice how to use a camera and become familiar with it. So in my first scene, my arrival at the well, I had to go to the well and pull up a water trough and pour water out of it into a little thermos mug. And I had a notion the night before shooting that I may have trouble doing that because I hadn't practiced it. So I asked the prop master, Eddie Fowley, I said, Eddie, could you take me out to the set tonight, bring some lights and bring me my gun, because I had the gun which was slung over my shoulder, and bring this water bag and the thermos mug. I want to practice this. So we went out at night in the desert. And I practiced, and I realized that the gun was slipping off my shoulder every time I tried to get the water out and pour it and all that. It didn't stay. So I found a way which was to sew my gun into my costume. I had the gun strap sewn into the costume so it didn't fall. Anyway, so the next day we shot the scene, and it went very well. And Eddie Fowley went to David. He said, do you know what this boy did all night? He said, what, what, Eddie? He said, he's been out here at night practicing his thing. And that was what clicked between David. He was very happy that I had done that. Greetings, Ali. My lord, Sheriff Ali. Uh, Lieutenant Lawrence, you have met Sheriff Ali, I think. Yes, my lord. Peter O'Toole and I did a scene where we had the giggles. We couldn't stop laughing for about two hours, and we couldn't shoot. Alec Guinness was very upset with us because we couldn't stop laughing. And he said, be serious, you've got to do your work. And we couldn't. You know, when you have the giggles, it's impossible. That was the scene in the tent with Alec and the man who reads the Koran. 
the poor guy, he had learned this scene very well. He'd been days rehearsing this, because they told him, when you quote the Koran, you cannot change one word. You have to learn it exactly as written. And the lines were very difficult. It was sort of, by the moon when it shineth, and the sun when it riseth, and things like that, which are very difficult to learn. And he was going along the corridors, learning these scenes. And when we went to shoot this scene, he had rehearsed it so much, he was so flustered doing it. You could see his eyes go, he'd say, by the moon, when it shines, <laughs> and we just got the giggles, and it was impossible. Every time he said, and now Selim, the brightness, we were And now Selim, the brightness. By the noonday brightness, and by the light when it darkeneth, thy Lord hath not forsaken thee. Then Alex started laughing, because he realized he had really been very hard on us. So the next take, Alec Corpse, I think he did it on purpose to say, you see, everybody can have this. And then David fell off his chair laughing, and then we stopped the shooting that day. That was a sequence that John Box and I had pre-prepared. I guess it took us about three days to find an exact spot where the sun would rise and Gaston would come into picture and go shuffling out. We had to dig a huge pit to put the camera in so that the camera was literally inches above ground level. So you see it virtually into infinity with the sun rising as this great big heat ball coming out of the bottom of the picture and then gas him coming across. And that was all done in a hurry because we only had about 15, 20 minutes to do everything. One of the problems, of course, particularly when you're using multi-camera, we had to make sure that whenever we were doing a shot that it showed an extent of the desert, that the sand was always in virgin form. Once you'd gone over it and left footprints, of course, you couldn't use that part of the desert anymore. I remember one day I spent a whole day lining up a shot to be shot the next day, and about half past five in the afternoon, as I was about to pack up and go back to base, an Arab driver with a truck came across the horizon and drove all the way across to where we were. I could have absolutely murdered him because it was useless. He'd left these great indentations of tire marks all over the desert, and, of course, it wouldn't be any use. What is it, Major Lawrence, that attracts you personally to the desert? It's clean. I can remember one take, which was with a whole vista of the background, this superb sand dune. And just as we we're about to shoot, there was one of those plastic coffee cups from the canteen that trundled right across the set. Those bloody paper cups. They blow about everywhere. And if one got blown out over the virgin sand, there was this dazzling white dot out there, it's got to be retrieved. And after you've retrieved it, you've got to rub out all the footmarks that you've made to get it. And I built all kinds of devices, right up to big powder puffs on the end of canes to do finer work, and try to put the ridges back in. And after each take, you've got to go out and fill in the bloody footmarks and then put all back into Virgin, it was an enormous problem. The script called for a shot, I think it was when O'Toole looks up, they see the sun, it's the anvil of the desert, which is the sun, which is when it's at its zenith at midday, when it's absolutely beating down mercilessly. And David actually wanted us to shoot the sun. I don't know how many times I tried, everybody tried to shoot the sun through the camera, and all it did was just burn a hole in the emulsion. I tried putting filters on, we tried using gauzes, we tried running the camera fast, <laughs> we tried closing the shutter, and, uh, in fact, nobody ever shot the sun. And, in fact, the shot of the sun at its zenith it is actually a painting. That's the only unreal thing in the movie. Everything else is all genuine. <laughs> the scene where the boy sinks into the sand. We had the wind machines there, and we had special effects to put the usual old porridge pit, and it wasn't working. In the end, David and Freddy were both a bit angry with this special effects man, and he was so upset, and he said, I quit, and he went away. And David said, good, bugger off. Eddie Fowley, take over. So I went over and had it all ripped out. <laughs> Took two or three hours. Meanwhile, I had the carpenters build a box, and I went into my prop truck, and I built an iris, like a camera iris, you know, with all layers, one over the top of the other, but I built it of rubber, floor rubber. And so, of course, the outer edges were thicker than the inner edges when it all came together. 
and that was slid on top of the box head wheel with me inside it, then sand over the top, and then they played the scene. And when the boy got in there, I just took him by the feet and lowered him and pulled him down through the box. At the time that David had told me he wanted to last, and it was a bit claustrophobic in there, especially when there were two of us down there, but it worked. Simple, you see. I believe in simplicity. All these scenes where we're tiny on the screen, riding camels, it was us. David insisted that we should be on the horizon riding those camels. It's not just sadism. I think he wanted us to feel what it was to be out there in the desert, what the Bedouins feel. We had walkie-talkies, that's all. They just said, OK, Omar, start going to your right. And cameras were miles away on the horizon. What David used to know about the film was, what is the first shot in the scene and what is the last, how it links to the next scene. That he knew. He's an editor, so he knew how to link a scene to the other. He used to come with no preconceived idea and sit there, watch the horizon, look at the desert, look at us, and say, all right, you fellas, do you have any ideas what you want to do? How do you want to do this? Let me see. We all rehearse, and he'd say, no, that's not so good. And then again, try it this way, try Hours, while everybody was waiting, hundreds of people in the crew, and then he would decide on something. He would never shoot the same day, he'd always shoot the next day. One day rehearsal, one day shooting. Sam Spiegel was an extraordinary man. He was the typical sort of man that you would hate and admire. But he was hateful. I mean, it was easy to hate him because he believed that people work better under pressure. David Lean didn't want him on the set at all. And David used to choose his locations in function of the fact that the producer couldn't get there or wouldn't want to go there. So he wouldn't shoot in a place which was accessible to the producer. So his idea is to go as far as possible where Sam couldn't come. And of course, we didn't see rushes or dailies. And so Sam used to send telegrams to say how it was. And he invariably said it was awful. He used to say the most horrible things about the rushes. But David didn't pay any attention. He said, oh, don't worry, this is typically Sam. Sam Spiegel was desperately keen to get David out of Jordan. And I think that we all had the suspicion that if it was possible for David to have stayed there, he'd still be there now. I mean, he fell totally in love with the Jordanian desert, and Sam was determined to get him out of it. Give them artillery, and you've made them independent. Then I can't give them artillery, can I? For you to say, sir. No, it's not. I've got orders to obey, thank God. Not like that poor devil. He's riding the whirlwind. Let's hope we're not. The film was shut down. Robert Bolt, by this time, was back in London writing part two. And he was quite a political man, Robert Bolt, very left-wing, flirted with communism in his youth, and took part in a demonstration in Trafalgar Square in London to protest against nuclear bombs. A lot of people did this. It was a sort of Easter holiday for a lot of people in England. They used to march, and it was a big event. And the police arrested them all, rounded them up, and Bolt was one of those who were arrested, went to court immediately, and was sentenced to a month prison because he refused to be bound over, which is a legal way of saying that I've been a naughty boy and I won't do it again, and here's a piece of paper that I will sign to say that I won't do it. He refused to sign that piece of paper, went to prison. Sam Spiegel went ballistic when he heard this, that his screenwriter was away for a month, and so went to prison and talked Bolt out of it. So he actually only served two weeks. Spiegel persuaded him to sign the piece of paper, and Bolt never, ever forgave himself for that, and never spoke to Spiegel after the movie ever again. You are mad. To come to Aqaba by land, we should have to cross the Nefud Desert. That's right. The Nefud cannot be crossed. I'll cross it if you will. The unit move to Spain. I am desperate about Aqaba. I have people out looking. Nothing has turned up. In the end, I said, I'm going to look myself. And I'm going to start at Almeria. And I found this 
riverbed. And the whole point about Aqaba was the Turks expected an invasion from the sea, because that's where the British always came. Lawrence had said, no, we don't go from the sea, we go across this impossible desert. And they attacked Aqaba from the land. And I could see in this riverbed the dust of the Arabs approaching. I could see that one major shot from the distance through the Turkish camp, through the town, and you had to finish looking at the sea with a gun just facing out. Did a model, did a sketch. Got David down from Seville. He was shooting by this time, and he agrees absolutely. Look out here to this wonderful bay. This is the Bay of Aqaba. This is where we built Aqaba. After we'd moved out of it, the real one, because it was no good. When we were doing Lawrence of Arabia, we wanted something a bit more spectacular, and we wanted an approach for our big charge, a place to put our big cannons, and a place to put the ships out at sea. This was a perfect location. May God, your agent, Aqaba! What was stressful in doing this charge on Aqaba was the fact that Peter O'Toole and I were galloping our camels in front of about a thousand extras on camels and horses. And the dust came up under the feet of the horses and camels. You couldn't see anything below the knees of the camels. So when we were galloping, it occurred to me that if we fall off, the whole troop will pass on top of us and kill us. So I had the thought of tying myself to the saddle. I actually tied myself completely to the saddle of the camel so that I couldn't fall, whatever happened. And Peter O'Toole actually fell one of the takes, but an extraordinary thing happened. His camel stood on top of him and protected him. He planted his four legs around where Peter had fallen. And the whole cavalry passed, but they couldn't get to him because his camel was standing there. There's something mysterious about camels. I was terrified of that experience. One of the things that frightened me, really, was falling. Not so much afraid of falling, that's bad enough, but the fact that these men were crazy. The Arabs are absolutely mad and they all had the sabers out for the attack and i thought surely i mean one of these guys behind me is going to run me through with a saber <laughs> i'm going to die in the middle of the desert i didn't know that uh, david had been very thoughtful and had put three of his best riders behind me to keep the others away from me he didn't tell me he wanted that ferocious looking fearful face rushing across the desert the wonderful thing when you have a director like David is that he makes you work. He makes you really work for him. It was very difficult because we had to derail the train. The engine had to come off an embankment. So we got a quantity severe in from England and we very carefully worked out the gradient of the embankment. And at a certain point, the driver had to jump off, so there was nobody on the engine, and we worked out where the locomotive should finish. That was critical, because we had to put a camera there, and we had to know where that locomotive was going to finish. At the time of shooting, Sam again said, David, it is very difficult to shoot the derailment of the train. It has to be done with great care, because we have to pull the locomotive back onto the line for the next take, if necessary. Johnny and his boys have worked it out, Johnny being me, will shoot the derailment. And you have very important scenes to do with very important actors. Then you come back and pick it up once the train has been derailed. I went down with a key camera position, which was the one nearest to where we thought the train would stop. We couldn't do trials, we had to work it out and hope the train didn't come straight into the camera. Action, the driver jumps off, the train comes over the embankment, comes straight at the camera. I can't see it stop. I thought I'd mucked it up because it created so much dust. You couldn't really see anything. And I was very despondent. But the dust made the shot in the end. When you saw it on the screen, 
We had a note from London, somebody had seen the rushes, marvellous, because it stopped in dust. My friends, who will walk on water with me? Who will come with me into Dera? Dera is garrisoned. Will you take 20 against 2,000? I'll go by myself if I have to. Lawrence goes to Dera with Ali. He shouldn't have really gone. He goes, he is captured. He's taken in in front of the bay, brilliantly played by Jose Ferrer. The interior had to be as simple as possible, the lighting critical. You. You have to see the sea, but Lawrence, in fact, was beaten and violated by the bay. You can't show it on the screen. You can show it now, and you can show far less in those days. But again, David, brilliant. He had Lawrence with his hands outstretched. And he had this Turk with this smiling face looking into his eyes and saying, you're going to love this. You really are going to enjoy it. And then comes the awful crack of the whip cane onto Lawrence's back. And then we just put in a raised area with a doorway for Jose Ferrer to stand in. And Jose said, what do I do? He said, you're not going to show anything. And David said, you stand in the door, you take your handkerchief out, and you start coughing. <laughs> and the coughing reaches a climax. <coughs> the climax has to be almost a sexual climax. It's all done with coughing into a handkerchief. We don't show anything. You finish the scene out in the street again, a built street, and he's just flung in this filthy water, and then Arnie takes him. He's a changed man. From that, he puts back English uniform again, goes to Allenby, and Allenby persuades him to attack Damascus, and he goes back and he does so. Oh, prisoners. Damascus, Lawrence. Arlie tries to persuade Lawrence not to attack them, go round them. Lawrence decides he is going to attack the Turks, and the famous yelled, he gives out, no prisoners. No prisoners! No prisoners! <laughs> and in fact, it's the effect on Lawrence, the character, which is always critical to this film. He kills and goes on killing and discovers he enjoys in a strange way killing people. There's a certain amount of stunts going on, but basically David and I said, no stunts. Don't get too elaborate. Show the beginning show the result and the result at the end is Lawrence sitting on the ground completely exhausted morally he's loved killing and he's got blood all over him that was the dramatic point we wanted to make the film started with the death of Lawrence and it is a well-known fact that Lawrence was killed on a motorbike and the decision is made to start the film with his death. So we had to shoot that in England. It finishes up with his goggles on a bush. And from that, we go to the only interior in the whole film, which is a 10 by 10 flat and a bust of Lawrence in St. Paul's. But we have to shoot outside St. Paul's. That has to be England. When the picture was finally finished, Peter O'Toole had a few drinks, as you can understand, and he arrived in Casablanca, and we were staying at a big hotel, rather like the Dorchester in London, called the El Mansour Hotel. And Peter went in the big swing doors, and there's a huge lobby crowded with people, and he yelled out, the fucking picture's finished! And everybody turned around. Well, sir, going out. Oh, sir. When you make a film and you've just finished it, any director is at his most vulnerable because you've imagined a movie in your head for months. You've hoped it would succeed. And if anybody says it's lousy, or at least I do, I, I react and I think we'll get it out quick if I can. At the end of shooting, we moved to London, and David was living upstairs in an apartment, and I had a cutting room downstairs. And I was talking to him about the French cinema and asking him if he'd seen the way that they were doing the Nouvelle Vague, as we called it in those days, with the direct cutting. 
which I admired a lot and thought was really fantastic. It wasn't really being done in England or America at that time, I don't think. And so I talked to David about it, and he said he hadn't seen any of those films. So he went to see a couple of them. And of course, he loved the idea. And then he came back and did it better than anybody else, like the direct cuts that we did in Lawrence. Salam. 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 They are good for riding. Try. I thought of the idea of him lighting a match, going, and as he blows it out, cutting to the sunrise. Just a red screen, and it works very well. I think that's one of my favorite cuts. Also, we did a thing which was inventive at that time, which was put a sound ahead in some cases, like the ringing of the bell at Aqaba. We had the bell ringing over the shop before. And we did that in several cases there, that put the train noise over and the tram noise and various things that we did. not designed like that. It was designed like the long shot, but they weren't actually meant to meet. But when it happened, he couldn't stop the camel. So he went on round like that and has become a superb shot. But that was a very, very difficult sequence to cut, him going back for Gazin. I remember that that was like a nightmare sequence. We couldn't get it right. We decided for logistical reasons, really, to cut the second half first. And we were working from nine in the morning until one or two in the morning, seven days. Originally, the idea with the music was to have three composers. We were asked by Sam Spiegel to show some scenes to Sir William Walton and Malcolm Arnold. We were really expecting them to love this because everybody else's reaction had been fantastic. Instead of that, they both turned out a little the worse the way for a good lunch. In the meantime, this French composer that was doing a film called Sunday and Cybele that Sam had put some money into, and he was very impressed by this guy's music, and he'd brought him over. The next thing I know is that Maurice Shah has written this fantastic Lawrence theme, which we all hear and think is fantastic. And next thing we hear, he's doing the whole movie. None of us saw that film, you know, from beginning to end before the first screening on Sunday morning. We didn't have time. We didn't have three and a half hours or three hours, 40 minutes to sit down and do nothing but watch a film. So Freddie and I saw the second half first and timed it, and then I think showed it to David. Then we did the first half, which we did second, the negative cutting and timing. Really just came off just before the premiere. I went to the premiere in London, but they didn't want me to go to America because they wanted to concentrate the advertising on Peter too. But Peter and I, while we were making the film, we were dreaming of going to America and the openings, etc. And when they told me that they didn't want me to go to America, I was so disappointed. And Peter knew that I wanted to go. And he said, no, I'm not going unless Omar comes with me. So we went together. And we had a lot of success. We were both nominated for the Academy Awards. So it was a wonderful sort of incredible adventure. As everybody knows, we finished the picture very quickly in the end. So when it opened at three hours, 42 minutes, I think it was, or something like that, they couldn't get many screenings in during the day. So they decided to cut it down. There was a lot of contention as to whether or not David was there at that first cut. And I know that I can say this now, that he was there and he was always involved. I must say, Lawrence, Sorry. You're a clown, Lawrence. Ah, oh, well, we can't all be lying to you. We took out about 20 minutes, I think. About seven years later, they started talking about releasing it for television, and they wanted it shorter still. They wanted another 15 minutes out of it. And luckily, I was available at the time, and David came back and did that again. It is my pleasure that you dine with me in what it am! They promised David that they would not put that version out in the cinemas, ever. 
Well, of course, this didn't happen. I mean, David found out that they were running this version in all the cinemas as well. At some point, they flopped over one of the reels. And I said Peter didn't wear his watch on his right hand. But anyway, we got it put right then. And then I didn't think about the picture for the next 15 years. This guy came in one morning and said, you know, they want to restore Lawrence to its original version. I said, well, never, they'll never be able to do that. They'll never find it, you know, because most negative after a few years is junked. And he said, no, no, my friend who's an archivist and a restorer and things, he's found a lot of material already and he wants to talk to you. So he then calls me and I say the same thing. I say, you'll never be able to find it. I said, but if you do, we have to put back the goggles. We must put that shot of the goggles in the motorbike. So I rang David and told him what they were proposing to do. And he was really quite excited about the idea, and he said to me immediately, make sure we put back the goggles. They found the picture negative, but the sound had completely disappeared. And so we had to get the actors back and watch the scenes. We knew what the dialogue was, because we had, of course it was written down, and some, that survived. And we'd try to match the, the written word with what we're seeing on the screen. Peter O'Toole came back. It was most extraordinary after 25 years. I hadn't seen him for 20 years. And in he walked, and we said, hello, hello, how nice to see you, etc." And then we started putting these pictures up on the screen, and Peter and I sat there and looked at them. And one scene, I said, Peter, I think you're even better than you were in the original film. He said, well, in 25 years, I suppose I've learnt enough to be able to play the scene now. You've got to match your voice. After this morning, you'll get it better. <laughs> <laughs> now I can play Hamlet. In the memory bank is stored away somewhere in some tiny little recess all these words and things that were done over a quarter of a century ago. So it's a question of mustering them from somewhere and fitting them onto an image which no longer exists for me as a very young man. Of course, with David aiding, drawing, encouraging, as ever, hard and yet stern affection. You're the most extraordinary man I ever met. Leave me alone. What? Leave me alone. Well, that's a feeble thing to say. I know I'm not ordinary. That's not what I'm saying. All right. I'm extraordinary. What of it? Lawrence Rabier is really about who is this person? Why was he important? What did he do? And why was he like that? There's this great scene at Suez Canal after he's trekked across Sinai, lost one of his friends, and they call across the canal to a British soldier who shouts out, who are you? And you don't really see the motorcyclist say that. What it is, it's a close-up of Lawrence's face, all covered in sand, he just looks like death. Lean himself dubbed that line, who are you? Who are you? And it's the key line in the movie, really, because the film asks, who are you? Never answers the question, because I don't think they knew, really. Least of all, Lawrence, he doesn't know either. He hasn't the foggiest idea who he is at that time. He doesn't know if he's a British officer, an Arab, alive or dead, really. Very complicated moment, that. And the fact that Lean dubbed that line was probably just one of those cutting room accidents. Yet it's... A nice sort of wonderful irony. I just love making movies. I have a sort of burst of adrenaline when I get behind a camera. I just love them. I like lenses. I like looking through the camera. I like composing pictures. What is amazing about Lawrence of Arabia is that how any people put money into this project. I think that's an admirable thing. Because if you had told at that time people to produce a film that's going to cost a lot of money without any big stars about Arabs riding camels and jogging across the desert, nothing more, no girls, no love story, no action, it didn't seem like it was going to be something that people would want to see. And it's amazing to have had the vision that it could work. The script was absolutely extraordinarily good. And when you shoot with David, he takes such pains over everything. He's so perfectionist. 
he requires perfection of everybody that you cannot imagine that all this is not going to pay. It's, it's impossible. Lawrence of Arabia is my favorite film, and I think it's the best of the films that I have made. It still stands up extremely well. You know, some films which are 40 years old, they lose a lot. They show their age. This film, I think, will never age. I think it is a real classic. It's a great piece of cinema.